love that song. I mean, it's just such a, a beautiful song. And as we were singing that, I was, I was just thinking, certainly in, in light of um, what we've been praying about in the, the Ukraine. But, and then, you know, you'll hear plenty of people talking about the Third World War. And uh, kingdoms rise and kingdoms fall, but the word of the Lord stands forever. He has been Lord, you know, it talks about Jesus, and he will reign forever and ever and ever. And that's important. And it's important that we, we have that confidence in, in, in Jesus. Because if, if you're like me, sometimes problems and, and th- small things in my life seem quite insurmountable. Like, for instance, if I have a a broken panel on my fence or something. You know, it seems like a major deal to to me. And yet, Jesus is creator of heaven and earth. He's he's ruling forever and ever. Anybody else like me at all? Little things bother you? And that's why we need to encourage one another. You know, we can help one another practically. But in actual fact, the truth is, Jesus is Lord. He's the king and he's, he's ruler of all. Now, we, last week, we, we had a go at sort of looking at this, this whole thing about Christ in you, about God in us, Christ in us, the hope of glory. It's incredible what, what's in our lives, that we are not ordinary people, that God has got a plan for our lives, and he fills us way more than we possibly could uh, imagine And he'll do, and his power in us, that same power that resurrected Jesus from the dead. And you think, well, my life doesn't reflect that. But it can do more and more and more. Mind, mind, you know, there's plenty of room for improvement in my my life, I I tell you that. But he's got a plan. He's working it out. And he's working on the inside of our, our lives. If you have given your life to Jesus, he's there on the inside, and he's changing you. And we can... Be, be glad about that. Now, what happens when you become a Christian? You become part of the, the church, and, and church is so important. It's, it's so important to gather together with other Christians to be encouraged. And also to be kept on the right path. It's very easy to wander off and add things to our, our religion. And I don't know about if some of you, do you ever feel like that some people are better Christians than you? Because they, they pray a lot harder. They fast more than you do. They have more spiritual revelation. They've seen angels. And they, they've had all these prophecies and stuff. Do anybody feel like, you know, there's some people like, oh, if I could just touch, you know, their, their, their coat. Anybody ever feel like that? That you're not, you know, there's people are a lot better Christians than you? Um, Sometimes, and so, some of these Christians, they would sort of have manifestations of healings and that type of thing. And, and it's definitely one of the things within our churches and within the church that we're not immune to um, getting taken up with visions, taken up with stories of angels, taken up with um, healings and stuff. And we don't always listen and we could think, do you know, if that person who sees loads of healings says it, it must be true. It's not necessarily the case. If that person is really, really devout, then it must be true if they say something. And that what was, was, was happening, and, and people with fine-sounding arguments were coming into the church in Colossae, um, and also they, they were ones, I don't know... If you ever come across it, I've come across it in the church, and I actually had a bishop um, apologize um, to, not to me personally, but was saying, because there's sometimes this is a hierarchy within the church, like, like certain churches, they've got big buildings, and they've got legal priests, and they've got this, that, and the other. They're actually the proper churches, and they look down on, on churches that don't have those things. And I, I, I had a bishop say to me, with humility of spirit, we've believed that lie and taken that on board. And I just want to say, we, we don't want to be like that. And um, 
one of, and sometimes it can be, you know, rules and re- tradition. You know, like so we've got all these traditional rules and regulations and uh, and things that we do that make us a proper church, and make us proper Christians. And we we, we had that in in, in Colossae, and and you'd also have people going and saying, well, you. Yes, you put, need to put your faith in Jesus, but you also need to get circumcised, uh, which was the passage that um, Ehechi preached on a little while back. And, and part of the reason said, you, actually, the real circumcision is the circumcision of your heart that changes you, that enables you to, to live for him and sets you free. But that was taught, particularly in the context where some people were saying, you need to get circumcised physically to be a proper Christian. And... Um, and then a load of other rules. And this is the context I want to talk about with you today. But it's very real for us in the church today. We need to understand when people are saying things. And uh, I've, whether it's about rules and regulations, what rules, how did Jesus summarize the rules up? It says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And that sums it all up. Tell me what written regulations, what list of regulations do you have to do to fulfill that? There's none, is there? It has to come from the inside that we can actually love God with all our hearts and minds and souls and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. So if people put rules and regulations on you, the Bible does clearly say, we can't use it as an excuse to sin, by the way, and that, that's sort of cut there, you know, certain things that are defined as sin, but religious traditions and practices, it's, Christianity is not about that in the slightest. Let's read this passage, and you'll just start to see some of the context of what um, we're talking about. So Colossians 2, verse 16 Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. Don't let religious people say that you're not doing it right. Don't let the world say you're not doing it right. I don't know, how many times do people say to you, oh, call yourself a Christian, and, and you sort of, you, you laughed, or call yourself a Christian, and you sort of... Um, you, you took great delight. The bowling greens just opened yesterday. Just so it, you took great delight when you sort of bowled and knocked, knocked them out of position and won the, won the end, and you were like, yes, come on. <laughs> Call yourself a Christian. You know, you know we, we do get it, actually, all the time, and you get it in religious circles. We can get it in church. People saying, oh, they're, they're, they're not, you know, proper Christian. I'm a better Christian, you know, because that's, that's the other side of the coin, isn't it? And that, what, what goes on, I'm a better Christian. Look at them. If, I, if, they, if they get to the sort of level of maturity that I am, it'll be brilliant, won't it? <laughs> Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration or a Sabbath day. And this was particularly talking about Jewish um, festivals. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and worship of angels disqualify you. Just to say about a shadow, if you see a shadow, what does it tell you? There's the light on or the sun's out. And if you see a shadow of an airplane going, occasionally you might see that, mightn't you? A shadow of an airplane going down the ground. What does it tell you? There's a a plane up top. (laughs) There's a real plane. The shadow's not the real thing, but it tells you that there's a real thing there. And uh, that's what we're talking about. These laws are a shadow, but the reality is found in Jesus. And that's the real thing. Do not let, verse 18, do not let anyone who delights in false humility. I think this is like a sort of religious pride, a religious spirit. You know, people just go on and on. If if your conversation is just so, do you ever have conversations where they're just so religious? Anybody get involved in conversations like that? And it just, oh, oh, I've had enough, you know, and you come away feeling like rubbish. 
Anyone have those conversations? Anyone sort of contribute to those conversations? I bet we all have it from time to time. But, but do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you. You know, some, it's quite common, if you look at church history, quite common for people to get, like, really focused on angels. And that's my guiding angel, and they tell me to do this, I do it, I do this, and I do it. The, the actually, it says, and you say, oh, wow, they see angels, they're sort of guided by angels. Well, you tell me in the Bible where anyone's got uh, their own angel, that you've got angels sent on specific missions to minister to, um, God's, to, pe- to people, do God's work. But um, do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you. Such a person also goes into great detail about what they've seen. And so you're talking about Paul. He, he sometimes talks about his spiritual experiences, but not loads and loads and loads. Because how, what does it make you feel like actually when people go, you know, occasionally you hear about these spiritual experiences and you think, yes, that's great. And there is a time to share some of them. But other times it's just which I'm sharing it to make myself look good. Even though that's not really your intention, but sort of deep down, that's what's coming up. And the, and, the, and the fruit, you have to look at the fruit of our conversation. And what does it bring about in someone? Does it make that person built up and know Jesus more and follow him more? Or does it make them feel like, oh, I can't live up to that? Um, so we have to think about the fruit of what we say. Such a person also goes into great detail. So they, they speak quite a lot as well. And you're saying, well, yeah, you are. There, there you are at the front speaking quite a lot. But you have a conversation with people speak and speak and speak and speak and speak. Such a person goes into great detail about what they've seen. They're puffed up with idle notions by their unspiritual mind. They have lost connection with the head from whom the whole body supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews grows as God causes it to grow. Is as we're part of a healthy church and healthy relationships, well, we've all got our part to play. There is no better Christian than anybody else. So Reinhard Bonnke is not a, or wasn't a better Christian than um, uh, Billy Graham or um, Fred or whoever it might be. There is no better Christian. And once we get that out of our heads, because we want, it's good to, be inspired by biographies. Absolutely, it's good to be inspired by them, and we can learn about our spiritual walk. And I encourage you to read biographies. But they are not the superheroes. We've got our own walk with God to live and to walk. And we need to do that as part of the body of Christ that you've got your role, I've got my role. And there, there isn't somebody who says, Well, because I've been in conversations where you get included and say, Do you, you know? It's great, you know, we're talking with a, you're, you're on my level type thing, you know, and we can, we can sort of, you know, and uh, shame they're not so mature type thing. And, uh, and, and you think, oh, look, we're part of the body of Christ together. They've lost connection with the head from whom the whole body supported and held together by its ligaments and sinew grows as God causes it to grow. Since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of this world, why, as though you still belong to the world, do you submit to its rules? Physical rules about physical practices. Do not handle. Do not taste. Do not touch. These rules, which have to do with things that are all destined to perish with use, are based merely on merely human commands and teachings. Now, this is where we can get taken up with stuff. And, and, and we go through different seasons in our life <coughs> um, where, you know, God's challenging us on something. And we do need to have an extra special discipline in our life because God's calling us to do something, to go through a season of fasting or, or extra prayer or something like that. But that isn't a rule. It's out of our love relationship with the Lord that he's asking us to do it, not because someone else has put it on us and saying, this is what you've got to do. And um, the thing is, such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom. So that's why we get taken in by them, 
because it appeals to our sort of human nature. It seems to make sense. It seems to make sense, you know, that, well, perhaps I should walk on my knees and go on to this and to show that I'm really, really sorry. You know, I need to walk up all these steps on my knees. Could that happen? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Church history tells us it does happen, but we can feel like, oh, I've got to do this. Or um, with their self-imposed worship, I've got to pray so many Hail Marys. I've got to do this penance. And I'm not picking on a church, actually, and saying this. I'm just pointing out situations where we see this in our world and in this church world today. Um. So there's various things. So I can pick it as, as well on the Pentecostal sort of side of things as well, is this desire to have visions and the, the, the focus on healing. And if someone has a ministry of healing or people fall down, then everything they say must be true. And what you find is when that happens, and, you, and you'll see this in church history, that people that have amazing ministries, there's quite a number, because they've been so exalted that they think that whatever they say is true, and they've gone down a path of error. And they've started to bring false teaching in. And that, and that can happen, because we don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater. We want healings. We want prophecies. We want to, you know, you know, God's angels to be released as he, as he sees fit. We want all of that to happen. We want people to be saved and delivered. So we, we don't throw it out with the bathwater. But when we're so focused on those things and we don't discern what right teaching is it's important a lot of the new testament is written about the right teaching i never realized this but i've seen this during the um, the covid time people sort of get involved there's so much to choose from how do you discern what is right and wrong the important i think one of the key elements is one is reading your bible and having a relationship with the lord another thing is just being in a healthy relationship within a church that keeps you Keeps you right. There's so much choice, and and people choosing such w- weird and wacky stuff um, to to follow, and it make it makes sense if if people are saying it with such. Um, what does it talk about them? Um, Well, it doesn't say it in this passage, but they, they were speaking like you know, with you know, apparent wisdom, and they were good speakers, and they were saying this, this, that much, and the other. There's so much that is said. People say, "Have you heard anyone say, oh, I know this expert. I've heard this expert, and they tell, and they, and they say this. They've done all the research, and it all shows this. Anybody heard that on the internet? Anybody heard that? Well, there's all sorts of experts." We can't lose connection with one another and with the head. We don't, why submit to the rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. And he's challenging this. You don't have to do these rules and regulations. You don't have to. The reality is found in Christ. Such regulations, verse 23, indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body. And where people would be like, you know, incredible fasting and whipping themselves. Remember Martin Luther? Uh, He he came, he was, um, you know, he would sort of crawl and make his knees bleed because he wanted to get his life right with God. And then he came to realize that justification was by faith in Jesus alone. It was the righteousness that comes by faith. And that changed and that's when the, the Reformation started. But he was right into all that sort of stuff. And the harsh treatment of the body. But the truth of the matter is, external regulations, you have to do this, that, and the other. And if you try to be a good person, try and be a good Christian, it doesn't work. They lack all these rules and regulations. They lack any value. They can't make you holy. (laughs) You know... If you tell a child, don't do that, it almost like it, it breeds something. It, like it, 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 it sort of starts something off in their thinking. Oh, I need to do that. 
And so that external rule provides, it's it almost like it, it, it creates something within them. Um, or what about, have you ever made a New Year's resolution? And it's like you make a, a man-made, remember we're talking about man-made rules and regulations. You make your own regulation and then, oh, it becomes such an issue to you. <laughs> so that, so, you know, the gym membership increases massively and then sort of <laughs> stops after sort of by the end of January. But it, the, the external rule creates something within us, like almost to fail. And actual fact, all the rules and regulations in the Old Testament and the festivals, they point to Jesus, who's the real thing. And I want to give you a couple of examples of this. Are you, are you all right with, me, with this at the minute? I just, um, it's, um, I want it to be grounded in our lives, okay? Because I want us to be disciples of Jesus that are growing and growing and impacting. And I, I you know, I'm, I'm really excited about what's happening at church. And, and, it, and it comes from people that are growing in the Lord and so we have all these various things going on, and yet we're a family on mission, and I, just something that's in my spirit, just take, God wants us to go further, to reach out. We've got these, um, and it's something that um, H um, was said in a meeting that we had, you know, there's thousands of people around us that perhaps we need to go out, so, and we've got something brilliant to invite them to. We've got something really, really good to invite them to, and we need to go out and take in that gospel, this good news of Jesus. Um, these feasts, it mentions a, a number of... So don't let people judge you by what you eat or drink with regard to religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. So just regard with eating and drinking. It was to do... Predominantly to do with idol worship, should we... Um, eat this food that's been offered to idols or not eat this food that's been offered to idols. But you get it in terms of today, you know, vegetarianism or, or whatever, you know, but that's a, a moral, it's become a moral issue um, type thing, whereas I don't think the Bible has it like that. Um, but it, it, can, it can also be to do with like the, uh, the laws of um, eating pork and, and things like that in the Old Testament. So don't let anyone judge you by that. Jesus said, and remember the Pharisees, they always came to Jesus asking him about, can we do this? Can we not do that? What's the right thing? You know, external laws that they came to him about. And Jesus always spoke to the heart. He always spoke to the real issue. They always came to him trying to trick him with external regulations. And yet the real issue is in the heart. So Matthew 15 um, then some Pharisees and teachers of the law came to Jesus from Jerusalem and asked, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. And Jesus replied, And why do you break the command of God for the sake of your tradition? For God said, Honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses their father or mother is, is to be put to death. But you say that if anyone declares that, that what might have been used to help their father or mother is devoted to God, they are they are not to honor their father or mother. With Thus you nullify the word of God for the sake of your tradition. You hypocrites. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. And uh, there was a time when the, um, they were eating from the corn of the, the field and, 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 and Jesus pointed out about David going and, and taking the bread off the altar. Um, and there was a, a pivotal moment in the book of Acts when Peter was up on the roof asleep and, uh, and God gave him a vision about eating unclean food. And it was pivotal because it that opened up the door for the gospel to be taken to the Gentiles. Um, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen and understand. What goes into someone's mouth does not defile them, but what comes out of their mouth, that is what, de what defiles them. Romans 14 verse 17 says, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but what is it of? Of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. 
What are we focused on? The external. Our lives are lived out in the external, but it's based on. It's not about rules and regulations. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to volunteer. You don't have to come to church. Why do you come to church? Because, oh, I have to, to be a good Christian. No, I come to church because I want to meet with God's people and I want to worship God and I want to obey what he says about meeting together with other Christians. I want to encourage my brothers and sisters. That's why it is. It's not because I got to. And that's even for me, I'm employed here. It's not because I've got to. (laughs) It's not a matter of eating and drinking. And Jesus very clearly said that. And just qu- quickly, those feasts, you can see them in, Le- mentioned in Levit- Le- Leviticus 23. There's, there were seven sort of annual feasts, um, like Sabbaths and special um, days. I just wanted to pick out um, a couple of them. The Day of Atonement was mentioned there, where they, that what happened was it was a day to sort of just cleanse and take away the sin um, of the, the people of God and it involved the priest laying his hand on a, on a lamb and then the lamb being taken out and sacrificed outside the, the city. It's called the Day of Atonement and um, there was a lot going on to do with that. I'm not going to into all the details. That is a shadow of the reality and the reality is found in Christ. Remember John? And John 1 says, the next day John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Do I need the the Day of Atonement? I don't, because Jesus fulfilled it all. So I don't need the Day of Atonement. When people tell me I need to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles, and I get, I get, you get that, actually, you get sort of Jewish, you know, um, sort of, um, People are very sort of pro-Israel, Jewish, um, very focused on that. They sort of say, well, we should be celebrating these feasts. Well, that's fine. They're very welcome to, and you're very welcome to celebrate it. But don't judge me if I don't, because I don't see the need to. But, I, you know, I respect that you, you've got reasons for doing that. But, I, you know, and, that, and that's the way we live. It doesn't stop me loving you. But there's no point having an argument about it or separating it with us about it. But for me, I don't need to do that. Um, somebody says, I, I, I don't eat black pudding because it's got blood in it. And others say, um, I, I love black pudding. It's great. Do you know what black pudding is? Yeah. Do you guys know what black pudding is? You ch- check it out and then don't eat it. <laughs> And some people don't eat it because they don't even like the thought of it. I've I've never had black pudding, but I just don't like the I just don't like the thought of it. <laughs> the Feast of Tabernacles is another one, and at the Feast of Tabernacles, um, part of that celebration was um, to to celebrate the the River of God, and and they they'd pour out water on the on the at the temple uh, steps or. And they pour out this water, and it's to symbolize the, the river of God that was talked about in Ezekiel 47. And, you know, there's a great celebration that when the Messiah comes, this river is going to flow from out of the temple. And then what did Jesus say in John chapter 7? And he said it in a loud voice in front of everybody. Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Here's the water being poured out on the temple. And he says, it's not that physical thing that you want. And come to me. A scripture said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the spirit whom those who believed in him were later to receive. This is incredible. And Jesus said, the reality is found in me. All of that was pointed... You know when um, Jesus um, resurrected from the dead and he was walking along the road to Emmaus with the disciples, a couple of the disciples, and, uh, and then he started explaining about himself from the Old Testament. And he, he went through, he did this Bible study and said, look, that was about me. That day of atonement, I died, I took that. And, and he goes through all these different things. 
Uh, just one more of these. The Feast of First Fruits. That's when they celebrated. It was like harvest. You know, they celebrated all the, the harvest coming in. Um, and in 1 Corinthians 15, it says, But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. You've got a feast of first fruits. Jesus is the first fruit of those who have risen from the dead. What does that mean? All the rest is going to come in, and we're going to go with him as well. It says, for since, for, But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. If you want to have a festival that celebrates life, it's found in Jesus. That's, he's the one that gives life. So all these things, these festivals, these religious rituals, they've got a purpose. They do have a purpose, but it points you to Christ. Rules and regulation, moral rules and regulations have a purpose to lead you to Christ. They, well, they have, a, they have a, for our fabric of society, it makes society work a lot, lot better. But the actual fact, anybody ever mess up, break any of your own moral codes or God's moral codes or society's moral codes? Have you ever broken any of those? Yes, we've all sinned. We've all done things wrong. It points us to our Savior for forgiveness of sins. So don't let anyone judge you because of your heritage or, your, or the outward trappings of religion. Don't do that. And you will get it. We, we, we do get it. Um, it. Interesting, the Pentecostal denomination, um, that, they had that all the time and constantly being looked down on. Well, we've become a bit more respectable now, so we don't, we don't get that. We probably need to be a bit less respectable. What about preaching the simple gospel? You know, oh, that's a bit ignorant and a bit sort of simple, isn't it? You're a simple church. Well, don't let anyone look down on us because of those sort of things. Don't look down on yourself because you think somebody is a better quality Christian than you. Just come before the Lord and you, you live out your life and walk with the Lord as part of the church and knowing Jesus as your head. Don't feel that you have to do penance for things that are done wrong. Yes, we need to do restitution if we're able to um, put things right, if we've done things wrong. But some, quite often we can't put things right. When you said something nasty, you, you can't really put it right. You can apologize, but you can't, you can't put the word back in again. Don't get taken up with the, the thirst for spiritual experiences. We, we, we hope to have spiritual experiences, but don't get caught up in that. Don't get over-impressed by people that have them. Don't get caught up with, you know, be over, uh, you know, concerned with people that go on about angels or they go on and on and about spiritual experiences and, and it's like a religion. Or prophecies or great healings. Don't get caught up with rejoice with things. Don't believe everything you read as well, by the way. Um, don't know how many times people have had to sort of put stuff down and said, oh, well, that wasn't true. Um, but don't get caught up with great um, people that have done signs and wonders and have great ministries and the largest churches. And don't get caught up and say, God must be blessing them. And what they say must be true. The best way to work that out is as part of a church in actual fact when there's things that concern you what can happen as well if we have a desire for all this you know incredible supernatural which of course we do want you know I, I, I'm not I'm really not doing it down is it, but I, I want to sort of say what the passage is saying really um, if we focus on that we'll set up for disappointment and yet Jesus is the one who satisfies. We develop our walk with Jesus. We will see miracles. I, I, I can, and over the years, you'll have heard me give testimony after testimony after testimony where God has done, you know, healings and miracles. In, I, I, I could just talk about when I worked in the warehouse and the, I did one after the other, after the other, after the other. So all the time in, in the workplace. Um, but sometimes it's seasons as well. 
it's possible to lose connection with the head, namely Jesus, and from the rest of the body. And some, some, you know, it's important that we are linked in with this. And the body grows as we're all connected together. Have a read of the passage and say, well, I thank you, Lord, that I don't have to submit to rules and regulations. You know, is it, is it, there's a quote, isn't there, somewhere, it says, love God. I think it said, love God and do what you want. I think that's the, the, um, the, the quote, I can't remember who said it was, but I think more biblically, be love God, love your neighbor, and do what you want. Because <laughs> if, if, if you do that, if you're loving God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength, and you're loving your neighbor as yourself, you'll be doing the right thing. You will desire to do the right thing, and it's not because you have to, but it's because of love. Shall we pray? Father, I want to thank you for your word. I pray that you'll just... Yeah, help it to grow in our lives. Help us to be people that aren't legalistic. Help us to be people that aren't caught up with uh, the wrong type of things. But Lord, that we are grounded and rooted and grounded in Christ and in faith in him. And then we just grow to such incredible um, capacity according to that power that's at work within us. Help us to walk and to please you. And I pray, Father, that you will use us to, to impact this, this neighborhood for you. Pray, Father, you'll give us opportunities to share about Jesus. And many people think it's about rules and regulations, Christianity. Will you help us to share a living and an alive and a current relationship and truth with people that we meet, Lord? Because I ask it in the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm.